there. Thanks for checking out this edition of R&R's Ask the Expert. I hope you're not tired of me saying that yet. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Ivan Turner. He is a 30-year veteran of the restoration industry. He has owned two restoration companies. He's written books. He's written articles. He's consulted. He's done all the things. And one topic that right now he's really passionate about is the importance of employee onboarding. You know, Hiring is really difficult in today's restoration industry. It has been for several years, but it continues to be difficult. And so if you don't have a proper onboarding process within your restoration company to not only train in the new people that you're hiring, but also help retain them and find buy-in in your company, you're gonna face more turnover within your company. So Ivan is here to talk about an employee onboarding process that he helped create for, um, for a restoration company. And he's now, um, hoping to share some of that knowledge with you, the people who are watching this, fellow restorers, so that you can create a cohesive, good onboarding process for your company that will also help your company as a whole reach the next level. Ivan, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's start by having you tell us a little bit about your background in the industry. All right. Well, uh, I will uh, sure, will, sure will, Michelle, but thank you, first of all, for having me on. Mm -hmm. I love r, &R Magazine, and I, I'm one of your probably biggest Fans that you don't even know I'm a fan of, but I, I watch all your po podcasts. Thank you. I've been in the restoration industry for 30 years. I've owned two restoration companies that were built from scratch, and I retired my restoration company in 2020. And I built a marketing uh, company in 2007 called Show Me Marketing Solutions. And that program was built to actually help me build my first business. And that's what it was built for. But I've been doing consulting and a little bit of coaching in the 30 years. And I also have written a couple books. One was on marketing to agents and adjusters. Another was another one was marketing to plumbers. And then, of course, I was published in uh, 2011 with I Broke the Code. So can you. Other than that, I'm old. So I've been around a long time. Perfect. Okay. So you spent the last six months or so with a restoration company, helping them create an onboarding process and helping them with their training. So in today's industry, it is so hard to find qualified people in the first place. So once you find them, this onboarding process is so important to retain your employees, get them engaged, keep them going. So um, what was the process of developing this onboarding manual that I, that you sent me and where do you go with a process like this? Okay, thanks for asking. That's a good question. Uh, onboarding, actually, the way I approach this particular company, it's a Midwestern company. They're about $5 million company on track for $10 million. Uh, very dynamic, uh, very fast moving company. So I knew the first thing I had to do was to talk to every single employee and every single manager to find out what the strengths of the company were, what the weaknesses were. Oddly enough, I learned pretty soon. Uh, once I started the onboarding program, that the company was well managed. It wasn't, there was no problems with management. Companies were, comp the employees were compensated fairly, but yet there really wasn't a clearly defined pathway to success. And that's what the onboarding program uh, achieved or was designed to do. So it was a long process, it took six months. Uh, but again, I had a lot, a lot of participation from the employees once I found out where they were at, if they understood their job, if they had any desires to continue to learn and grow with the company. Because you know, the thing is, Michelle, not every employee has the desire to grow at, at one particular state of their career. Maybe they will later on, maybe they won't. And then also another thing was I had to learn how the employees learned the best. You know, some people learn well by lecture style, me, I've always learned about, well by lecture style. Been to a lot of conferences, conventions, but I'm also a reader. I read two or three books a month. So that's how I learned the best. But I realized we had a lot of employees because there was such an age range in the employees. A lot of our employees didn't learn so well, didn't re lecture style didn't resonate with them. Uh, so we introduced REITS Training Academy uh, for the employees which is an awesome program for any resort that happens to be watching this. And then uh, on the job training, some employees just absolutely learn the best with on the job training, hands-on. Show me once, show me twice until I learn proper uh, techniques. Okay, so in our emails back and forth, you mentioned the term balanced restoration company. There was emphasis on that. So what does a balanced restoration company look like? 
Well, best way to explain that, and thanks, Greg, thanks for reminding me about that question. Uh, a balance, first, I always look at a business, my businesses or other businesses. The first thing I do is I look at them and I say, okay, business, restoration business is typically a pie, if you will, with three parts, three primary parts, administrative, operational, and marketing and sales. And having an unbalanced pie, for example, would be you could have the best marketing in the world. And you've got good sales efforts. You've got a lead generation machine that's just dynamic and overwhelming and your funnel's getting filled to the brim. But if you don't have the technicians or the production staff to serve the, the incoming or the inflow, then you're going to fail on the customer fulfillment side of the business. So that's unbalanced. So you look at a business to try to get a balance. You want to make sure that the growth doesn't exceed the production capabilities and vice versa. In all parts of the business, you, you have to have balance, really. Yeah, okay. So looping back, I guess, to this onboarding conversation. So what are some of the key elements that need to be in a good, effective onboarding process? Yeah, there's a lot. Uh, number one is rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. Every business has to have a personnel policy manual. That's a given. One of the big things is to that you have to have is you have to have structure. You know, everybody's everybody knows about the certain things that employees want in their in their life. They want security. They want peace of mind. They want a career path if, if that's their choice. And they want fairness. They want integrity. But above all else, they want structure. So a business has to be structured for an employee to actually first of all, come into the company, but secondly, to be uh, make it into a career. Because restoration is a very, very tough industry. And we all know nobody wants to be a restoration technician. I didn't want to be a restoration, restoration owner when I first started, but that's just what I did. I wanted to be an airline pilot. But um, so structure is a really important thing for employees. And that's part of an onboarding program. It's a structure. So everybody knows what the parameters of growth are and then know how we're going to teach you your job and and um, and we're going to be honest about it and honesty is the number one thing behind any successful business yeah okay so onboarding doesn't just stop after you train a person into your company right i mean onboarding is this continual process of investing in your people so what does onboarding really look like what does it actually mean well onboarding is a, it's a ongoing process. It goes throughout the, the time of the company. For example, if you're a $3 million company today, but you're hoping to be at $5 million, if you build an onboarding program to fit a $3 million company, then it won't work for a $5 million company. So it's, an, it's a living document. And that's really important to understand. Uh, so the other thing is, speaking of onboarding and growth, most companies actually don't have a organizational chart or hierarchy chart. That's very important to have one for the company, but you should have one to show employees that just start and just recruited an employee. If you're a $2 million company and your plan is to be a $5 million company in five years, for example, or $10 million company in 10 years, you should be able to show them the hierarchy charts so they can see where the management positions might be available at some point in their career. And that gives them something to work towards. Okay. All right. So um, is there anything else that we missed? Anything you want to talk about onboarding that we didn't talk about? Where do people start if they don't have an onboarding process? Where do you start? Well, you should have an onboarding program, but not every company needs one. Okay. Uh, I want to be clear on that. Um, but if you're a company that wants to scale, that's a given. You've got to have one. And nothing will impress a new candidate more than anything else other than having an onboarding program where they can say, wow, this company really knows where they're going. And they really show me a way that I can go with them. I can grow with them. Um, there's so many more pieces involved in onboarding program, Michelle. Uh, it, it's just, it, it actually starts in the recruitment process. Onboarding starts before you even hire an employee. Um, and everything, all your messaging, your Facebooking, your social media platforms. Um, smart companies take advantage of that. And I would recommend any company that's doing a million dollars or more a year to get your videos, 
uh, your employees' videos. Hire a professional to come in to ask the question of your employees. Why do you like working for Acme? Or why do you like working for Disaster Brigade? And let the employees speak the truth. And if they speak the truth and they're really happy with the company, and if your, your prospect, your prospective candidates see that, they're, they're really going to have a pretty good feeling about the company before they even join the company. And one of the other things that I think, which we started at this company uh, up north, was the very first day was the orientation day. That's a very critical day for a new employee. Some companies just throw you out onto a truck and you're left on your own or you're with, with another technician or potentially a, a, maybe a lead. But what I started with the onboarding program was that the very first day, which was orientation day, lasted about seven hours. During the morning, each manager would sit down with the employee, or rather the employee would sit down with the manager in their area. So the manager could give them an idea on what it is that they do for the company, how they do their estimating, why they do the things the way, the way they do. And so I always called it the station of the cross. So it started with the administrative assistant, new employees would sit with her for a few minutes, maybe 10, 20 minutes, so they could see how she answered the phone and how she communicated with our customers. And then move on to the next station of a fire manager, water damage manager, construction manager, and on and on and on to matriculate them into the company in the sense that they could see that, yes, I am important here. I, I do have a role to play. I know how I fit into the big picture. Okay. So, um, all right, let's talk about what's next on your plate here. So for those that are watching, Ivan has some articles on r, &R website. He also has a book that he's written before, but what's coming up in the future for you, Ivan? I hear that there's maybe something new coming out. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually pretty excited. Uh, it's a book I've actually been working on for probably 25 years. It's a, uh, all the lessons I've learned, uh, that are good, some lessons I learned that were bad. And the title of the book, which will be released within two months, hopefully, is Confessions of a Serial Restorer. The subtitle is, I Danced with the Devil and Lived to Tell the Story. So that should be released in a couple of months. In the meantime, I'm just still doing consulting, um, coaching, mm -hmm. but I love this industry, Michelle. It's, a, it's, it's just probably the best industry I could have ever been involved in. And you know, uh, one of the other things I want me to say about onboarding and about hiring employees and moving employees to a company. Oftentimes, if you ask a restorer, what is it that you do? They'll say, oh, well, I, I restore houses. I restore lives. But if you really think about it, as a business owner, as a restoration owner, we're really in the, in the people moving business. We move people that have had a bad situation in their home or their office. We move them from a terrible situation and we restore their property, move them to a good situation. But we often don't think about what we do for employees. We're in the employee moving business as well. If you're lucky enough to recruit someone to this industry, and this is a rough industry, there's gonna be bad days and good days, but we're in the people moving business. We're moving them from a place of no experience to a place of actually a place of meaning. And I don't think there's a better thing a restoration company could do. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, well, I'm not gonna offer any spoilers on who the devil is in the book, Ivan told me. So you guys are gonna have to pick up the book to find out who the devil is. I'm happy to have the inside track. My guess was wrong. So I think most people who are watching, I think their guess will be wrong too. And I think that there, there will be a lot of value in that book. So Ivan, thank you so much for your time. I've loved this conversation. Anything else you wanna add in there before we totally no. Well, first of all, thank you, Michelle. But no, I just want to tell you that what you're doing uh, is vitally important, especially through the time of COVID or the year run amok, as I like to call it, um, when everybody was pretty much locked inside and knowing where we had to communicate or to learn were from podcasts like this. So again, thank you for what you, you've done for the industry and what you continue to do for the industry. I really appreciate it. I know I, I'm pretty sure I can speak on behalf of 98% of the industry. For sure. Thank so thank you. you. I appreciate that. And thank you for your time and your expertise as well.